My name is Corey, and I've spent a lot, and I mean a lot, of time camping, hiking, and hunting. I've seen all kinds of predators, and I've been in some sticky situations. Everything from a tornado heading my way to being tailed by some bears, so I don't exactly frighten easily. This past July, I was out camping near my family's farm in western Iowa, along with my girlfriend Alexa, my best friend Jason, and his new girlfriend, Samantha. Samantha actually had never been camping before, let alone more than a mile off the trail in the middle of a forest. She was understandably nervous, but we were watching out for her. We do have to watch out for prairie rattlers, poison ivy, and even mountain lions in this part of the state. We made camp in a clearing on top of a small hill with a few trees, but we were deep in the woods to be sure. We arrived to make camp, eat, drink, and went to bed by midnight. Nobody had any injury besides a few mosquito bites. Everything was going according to plan until, suddenly, I woke up to the sound of Samantha screaming at the top of her lungs. I just couldn't believe how loud she was screaming, it, it was actually insane. I woke up, I, I guess at the same time as Alexa, grabbed my light and my Glock and ran out. I told her to stay in our tent just in case. Jason was already trying to comfort Samantha and she was talking, almost babbling about something huge walking through camp and scratching at the tent and making a terrible sound. I told her it could have been a coyote or even a mountain lion. What little food and trash we did have was outside of the camp area so that wasn't an issue. But I assured her that I would stay up and light the fire again that I would take turns with Jason watching the fire because our movement and the fire should scare anything away. This seemed to comfort her and she actually went to sleep in with Alexa. Jason and I both stayed awake talking quietly, watching the fire and checking around camp for tracks and signs. We couldn't see anything obviously wrong or suspicious. It certainly could have been a mountain lion and this did have me on edge with the girls there. About 30 minutes had passed and Jason walked just out of the firelight to take a leak. He was off to my left, my tent across the fire in front of me and Jason's tent behind me. There, off to my empty right, I saw something and heard a large crunch. Jason heard it also and was practically still pulling up his pants running towards the fire. What the hell was that? That is big, he said. I, I know, it could be a big cat. Better get your 44 out of your bag too and get that bright tack light, I told him. He returned with those items and we waited to illuminate whichever area we heard more movement from next. Then we heard a crunch and a snap. More movement almost directly behind us. We stood up simultaneously and spun around, turning the brightest light on. For just a second, we saw what almost looked like a gorilla-sized and shaped figure disappear back into the trees. At this point, I'm trying to keep it together and Jason is just frozen. I tell him to snap out of it and that we need to get the fire to grow. Once the fire is larger, we both need to take a position, one in front and one in the back of the tent to protect the girls. We heard this awful grumbling and growling sound for the rest of the night. I have never heard anything like it and large crunching and snapping sounds continued to emanate from the woods behind Jason's tent and really all around us. Periodically, we would see something move either to our left or right in the clearing just outside the trees. I kept the fire going. I actually had the fire pretty enormous by the end of the night. As soon as the sun started coming up, we packed up. On our way out, we saw large prints in the mud down by a small stream at the base of the hill we were camped on top of. I can't really say anything other than the fact that they basically looked like a huge man's prints. The thing we saw was definitely not a man. I, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was going to hurt us. I, I don't know if it was Bigfoot. Frankly, I don't want to know. The way I see it, it's really not relevant because I was thinking it was a mountain lion initially. Those are also dangerous. I won't let this stop me from camping. Sometimes I guess you just hear scary things at night in the woods. Because scary things do live in the woods. I guess that's just part of the adventure.
I've been working at McDonald's now for over five years, and this is still my creepiest experience there. This happened two years ago when I was 18, and I had been working my first overnight shift on front counter. I usually work in the kitchen on overnights, so I had no interactions with any of the customers until then. I was working from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m., which is a usual overnight shift for us. Around 3 a.m., I was making some fries when I noticed a man standing there and trying to take pictures with his cell phone of me and my other female coworker, Rebecca. I pointed it out to her, and she just rolled her eyes in annoyance and went to take an order and drive through telling me it happened a lot. I was instantly uncomfortable. I wanted to tell the manager, but he was in the office doing his manager stuff, and I didn't want to bother him. I went over with what I felt was a nervous smile, and quickly did my usual greeting. Hello, what can I get for you? He just kind of looked at me and stayed quiet. He was about 5'8", white, early 20s, medium build with dark hair and brown eyes. An average man, I would say. But something about his piercing glare made me feel super uncomfortable. Then he smiled, a smile that sent shivers down my spine. I'll just have a coffee, black, sweetie, he said, and I could instantly smell alcohol on his breath. I nodded and told him the price before he pulled out a $5 bill and went to hand it to me, making sure our hands touched. I avoided his gaze and went to hand back his change when he winked at me and went to go wait for his coffee. I went to go make it as fast as I could, but, just my luck, we were out of coffee on both the front counter and the drive through as we don't sell much through the night. I turned around and kept as little eye contact as I possibly could. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to brew you a fresh pot. Should only take about three minutes. Don't worry, I don't mind. I have quite the view while I wait, he replied, shooting me a wink. I just smiled awkwardly and looked away. I had to make sure I didn't fall behind on my shift, so I began to set up the muffins on the display so we had them all ready for breakfast, which starts at 4 a.m. in Canada. So, Susan, I heard behind me, realizing it was the guy. I instantly tensed, wondering how he knew my name before I noticed I had my name tag on and quietly cursed to myself. I turned around and looked at him. And he said, What time are you stuck here until tonight, beautiful? I instantly panicked as I didn't do well in these situations. I, uh, seven, I said nervously, which then the guy gave me a huge grin. Oh, so you still have time before you're off, eh? I nodded and noticed the coffee was done pouring. So I went over and made his coffee as he watched me with an intense stare. I handed it to him before saying, have a nice night, earning me another wink. He then waved and said as he turned around, I'll see you later, Susan. I watched as he walked out the door and tried to calm myself down. He doesn't actually know when I'm off, so I'm okay, I thought to myself. 6 a.m. rolled around, and it was finally time to go. I still felt a little paranoid about the guy, but I knew it was now in the past. My coworker Chris was going to drop me off at home as we carpooled, so we got our stuff together and left. As we were heading to his car, I noticed a parked car with someone in it, and of course, it was the guy. I panicked and quickly told Chris that was the guy, as I had told him what happened not long ago. He instantly brought me into his coat and did his best to keep me hidden as we walked quickly to his car. He made sure no one followed the car, dropped me off, and watched as I went inside telling me to stay safe. I thanked him before going into my house and going to bed. The next day, I went into work and got asked by my manager how I got home. I told them Chris gave me a ride. 
My manager looked confused and said something that made my blood run cold. Oh, that's strange, because some guy was here looking for you just before seven. He said he was here to pick you up. I thought before that the man's intentions weren't good. Just the way he looked at me and spoke to me, like I was prey. And this pretty much confirmed it. Since then, I have refused to work front counter overnight shift, and we no longer wear our name tags overnight. So, I've been watching a YouTube series about deep web exploration. I won't name this series or the channel it belongs to, I mean, I'm not getting paid for advertisements. Anyway, I looked up a video on how to access said deep web. I did it fast and dirty, not much research on what not to do. Big mistake. Let me tell you right now, using Windows on the deep web is a bad idea, that much I did know. Easy to get hacked that way since it's the most prominent OS. I know you can boot up a live USB on a Linux clone OS, I mean a simple Google search can tell you how to do that. It's not as difficult as it sounds but I figured if my laptop gets hacked, I'm screwed. I can't exactly afford to just buy a new one right now. So I thought I'd be smart and use my Android tablet. What a genius, right? Yeah, I know. I'm an idiot. So, a few VPN apps later and I'm surfing the deep web, looking around like a little kid in an adult store. I have no clue what any of it means, but I'm interested in it all. I'm aware you can find a lot of snuff in pedo rings, so I treaded carefully. Unfortunately, I stumbled upon one of the two. I'm not going to say which, but it made me sick to my stomach and I nearly quit then and there. In fact, I did, for a few minutes. I chalked it up to bad luck and resolved to be more careful. I'm not into that shit, not by a long shot. I'm not some deviant with fetishes for snuff or kids. Jeez, man. That image will probably be burned into my brain for the rest of my miserable life. Anyway, I'm browsing for a few hours and it's after 3am. I've heard it's better to use the deep web at night, less traffic that way. I found a few interesting sites. There's tons of religious stuff on there, you'd be surprised how often you find Satanists. Or at least people who claim to be Satanists. Most of the time it's likely to be some edgy teenagers rebelling against their religious families. I won't get into my religious views, don't worry. It even has several of its own social networks and email services. No thank you. You're begging to be stalked by some creep if you use one of those. Or better yet, get scammed by a catfish or honeypot. There are loads of conspiracy blogs as well. Both interesting and hilarious. Everything from Justin Bieber is secretly a reptilian member of the Illuminati to leaked files on human experimentation. There was even a guy who claimed to have stumbled across interdimensional travel via falling into an actual rabbit hole. As in, a literal physical hole in the ground made by a rabbit. I'd say you can't make this stuff up, but clearly you can. I was serious about the human experimentation, by the way. You're going to want to avoid that kind of stuff. If you had any faith in humanity, you'd lose it in a heartbeat. My god, I, I mean I hope that stuff wasn't legit. Gun shops, drug shops, celebrity nudes, pirated movies, hackers for hire, hitmen, virus programmers, script kitties, stolen credit cards, you name it. There was one site that sold stolen US currency that was supposed to be marked for shredding due to age or poor condition. Seems like they got a lot of business too. No wonder the economy is in the toilet. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of legitimate stuff on there too. I visited the site of a really smart dude who was creating his own custom operating system. Even had games and stuff on it. There was funny things too. A mock cult made for people named Dan was among my favorites. The people that weren't maniacs seemed to be open-minded, if a little paranoid. Then I came across a site that supposedly gives you access to the webcams of people's personal laptops. I was curious. I shouldn't have been, I know. I'm not expecting to see some cam girls here. 
just some slack-jawed people staring blankly at their screens while watching Let's Plays or some shit. And that's exactly what I saw. Neckbeards, teenagers, old men looking confused, the works. Here's me laughing at unsuspecting people. Then I, I saw myself. Ha ha, very funny, I thought sarcastically. It's tapping into my camera and trying to give me a good scare. It almost did, at first. Even so, I logged off. I kinda realized how bad what I was doing was. Not to mention how illegal it was. I went back to the clear web and watched some Netflix. Soon enough, I had all but forgotten about my deep web exploits. Then my Skype starts ringing. Another Skype number is calling me. I think maybe it's one of my friends trying it out. After all, I have been pestering one of them for a while to get on Skype so we can chat while playing games on Steam. So I pick it up. At first there was silence. Then I heard a voice. A man's voice. He sounded like he was an older guy, 50 plus. Looking good, he said. Without a second's hesitation, I hung up, deleted every deep web related app on my tablet, shut down and restarted my router. I have no fucking clue how that guy got my Skype number. And to be quite honest, I don't want to know. All I know is, if you're going to use the deep web, I beg of you, for your own safety, do more research than I did. Talk to someone who has experience in setting up a proper VPN or some other kind of anonymity. You're sure as hell not going to find it on fucking Google Play. This happened to me about seven years ago. I worked at KFC through high school and college. I went to college really close to where I grew up, so staying at the same work location was very easy for me. One day I went to work at 4.30 and had to work to drive through half of my shift due to someone calling off. It seemed like a regular day until we were getting ready to close. At around 10.50 p.m., this guy walked in and stood by the front register. He looked weird as if he just came from a costume party. I let him know that when he's ready to order, just tell me, as I'm cleaning due to us closing in 10 minutes. He told me that he wasn't ordering and wanted to know what time he closed. I told him 11 p.m. and he left. I'd noticed that he got inside a van that has been sitting in the parking lot for hours. I thought it was weird but continued to clean up. There were a few of us still on shift. Again, everything seemed regular that night. I grabbed the trash and went outside toward the dumpster. As I approached the dumpster, I noticed someone trying to hide in the shadows behind the dumpster. I stopped immediately, and I tried to squint in order to get a better look. Then whoever that was behind the dumpster moved back so I wouldn't be able to see their shoes anymore. But they didn't know I already saw them. I turned around immediately and went back inside. I told my manager he went to the door with one of my co-workers to get a better look. They couldn't see anyone, so they went outside to check it out and left me inside by myself. I felt safe while they were outside. I went to the cash register at the drive-thru to cash out for the night. Then on my left, I swear I saw the man from earlier in the window. He had a blank look on his face, then he started hitting the window with a dead raccoon trying to get in while yelling my name. I ran to the front door as my manager and co-worker were walking back in. I frantically told them what happened, and my manager ran back outside to the window while my co-worker stayed with me and called the police. The guy left before my manager was able to get him. The cameras outside got the license plate, but it didn't match the description of the van, and the plates were registered to a woman. This guy was never found, and I am forever worried that he will come back for me.
When I was 21, I transferred to a college in San Francisco. I checked out a room for rent on Craigslist. It was in a really nice two-bedroom apartment. It was cheap rent and close to campus, so it was the ideal spot. The girl who lived there was 29 and her name was Beth. She was tall and wide, and she had jet black hair and wore pale makeup. She seemed nice, although a little quiet, but she seemed to like me and agreed to let me move in. So far, so good. My first night there, we went out for pizza, and that's when I could tell that something was a little bit off with her. Throughout dinner, she kept telling me how much I looked like Shia LaBeouf. I didn't know what to say, so I just shrugged it off with a, thanks? I mean, I looked nothing like Shia LaBeouf, so it just didn't make any sense to me. When we got back home, she asked if I had seen her room yet. I said no, and she took me to see it. Her walls were covered in posters of Shia LaBeouf. She had even printed out photos of him all over her mirror. She owned all of his movies. I, I mean, I didn't know what to make of it. It was creepy. The whole night she had been saying I look like him, and now it's obvious to me that she's obsessed with the guy. A few weeks passed, and I never really saw her that much. We didn't spend any time together, really. She would come home from work and practically run to her room. She would spend the whole night in there. She had this really creepy high-pitched giggle, and I would hear her giggling through the walls at night. I wondered what the hell she could possibly be doing. Occasionally, she would come out and talk for like two minutes, and then she would always be slurring her words, so I suspected she was drinking a lot. Sometimes she wouldn't say anything, and she would just stand in the hallway and watch me in the living room. I would turn and see her and be surprised and say something like, Hello, Beth. And then there would be this long, awkward pause, and she would just give out her creepy, high-pitched giggle. It was uncomfortable being around her. She gave me the chills. One night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. because I heard what sounded like the front door being unlocked. I came out of my bedroom, and all the lights were off. But I could still see Beth standing at the front door. She had her face against it and she was turning the lock back and forth over and over again. And every time she turned the bolt, she mumbled my name. Max. 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 Seeing her standing in the dark and mumbling my name really freaked me out. And it doesn't help that she kind of looks like a bigger version of the girl from The Ring. I just quietly went back to my room and tried to sleep. One night, I was watching Gladiator and she stumbled out of her room and turned on the living room light, forcing me to pause the movie, which was annoying. She then asked me if I wanted to hear about her ex-boyfriend. It was an uneasy segue into the topic, but I just said sure and then awkwardly sat back to listen to her. Ten minutes into her story and she was extremely riled up. She was screaming at the top of her lungs about their breakup. I was worried that the neighbors were going to call the cops and she wasn't listening to me when I was asking her to lower the volume. Amidst all of her screaming, one thing she said really freaked me out. She was in such a fit and she yelled that she'll slit his fucking throat. That was a big game changer. Suddenly I had no idea what this girl was capable of. I mean, she was practically a stranger and everything I had seen was becoming alarmingly disturbing. After a few more minutes, she told me thanks for listening and started doing her giggle. I got out of there pretty fast and went to my room to go to sleep. I had a pretty unsettling feeling about being in the house with her. And what's worse is that there was no lock on my bedroom door. I pushed the edge of my dresser in front of it to act as like a little barricade. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my dresser scraping against the floor. Beth was pushing the door open. I turned on my light, shouting at her to stop. I could see her through the opening of the door. She was so drunk and had this insane look in her eyes. I pushed the door closed and yelled at her to go to bed. I could hear her walk back to her room, but I couldn't fall back asleep. The next morning when I went out into the hallway, my heart dropped. I saw that one of her steak knives was on the floor by my door. I got goosebumps all over my arms. All I could think about was her saying she would slit that guy's throat. I confronted her about it, and she said she didn't remember trying to push my door open. She said she didn't even remember telling me about her ex. I had enough. My lease was month to month, so I found a new spot and moved out. 
about a month after I moved out, she contacted me. I was at the movies and my phone was off. When I got out, I turned my phone on. And to my shock, I received 40 plus text messages that she had sent me over the past two hours. They were all just insane texts that ranged from everything between, Hi, how are you? to, I fucking hate you. It was insane. I didn't respond and I never heard from her again. I always wonder, if I hadn't set my dresser in front of my door, would she have quietly crept into my room and slit my throat? It freaks me out. For a little backstory, I'm trans. I try to present as male as best as I can, but it's still pretty obvious that I'm biologically female. I have short hair and I wear guy clothes, but I have a very unmistakably female face. I also live in a very religious area, so it's not a very common or accepted thing. One of our neighbors is a priest, but he's very accepting and his house is a bit like a second home for me because I think of him like one of my grandparents and he sees me as a grandson. Anyway. I was walking home from school during the winter a few years ago and it had started snowing. Needless to say, it was pretty damn cold and I was miserable. The wind felt like it ignored my clothes and chilled me right to the bone. It was hard to hurry because the freezing wind made my muscles really stiff. I was only maybe a quarter of the way home when a car slowed down and pulled up next to me. It was just a little old lady. She looked nice enough and at this point I was willing to do anything to get out of walking another three miles in the cold so I got in when she offered to give me a ride. It felt a hell of a lot better in that car than it did to walk. She was very nice at first. She prattled on about how her grandchildren went to the same school as me, talked about how lucky we were to live in such a nice Christian community, and so on. When she started on about being a good Christian, about how much she loved Jesus, I was a bit uncomfortable, but I didn't say anything. After all, even though I'm not a Christian myself, it isn't my place to say anything about religion. Believe what you believe and all that. She'd just been nice enough to give me a ride, so I didn't want to offend her. When she started talking about Leviticus, that's when I knew I had messed up by getting into her car. She started going on and on about gay people and how they're just confused, how man should not lay with man, and so on. We were getting close to where I was going to have her drop me off. When I mentioned that she could drop me off there, she looked over at me and didn't say anything. She didn't slow down either. I was starting to get nervous. We passed the point I'd told her about. I looked over at her and said something along the lines of, You can let me out here. She gripped the steering wheel really hard and said, I can't let you out. You need me. I asked her what the hell she was talking about and she turned to me. Your short hair. I knew I needed to help you when I saw it. You're a sick girl. You need to let go of the demon inside you. I tried to cast aside the discomfort of being called a girl and stumbled out something about just liking short hair, having a boyfriend, anything that would make me seem a little bit more innocent in her eyes. But it didn't look like she believed me. I wanted to cry as I watched the drop-off point get further and further away. I begged her to let me out, promised that I would go to church, repent my sins, as long as she let me out and let me go home to my family. She screamed at me that she hated dykes and that she was going to call her son to help her, quote, fix me. At that point, I knew I needed to get out. I grabbed the handle and unlocked the door, only to feel my hopes sink as the electric lock kicked in and relocked it. She was still screeching about how I just needed to be with a man and it would fix me. That accepting God's truth would fix me. It might sound ridiculous to be afraid of an old Christian lady, but I was terrified. I was so scared of what would happen if I didn't get out. I took my chance and rolled down the window as fast as I could and made a jump for it. I landed on a pile of rocks and my breath was knocked out of me. I could hardly move. Everything in my body hurt horribly, but I knew I needed to get out of Dodge before she decided to come back. I got up and limped into my neighborhood. As soon as I came to that old priest's house, I snapped out of the stupor I was in and was hysterical. I banged wildly on the door until he let me in, and I cried uncontrollably while he called the police. 
I was taken to the hospital after I told the police what had happened. The jump from that car broke my femur in four places and cracked both my knees. It amazed doctors that I was able to make it to the priest's house in the condition that I was in. I've never seen that lady again or her car, but since then I never walked to or from school alone anymore. I can only hope nobody ever got into her car again.